Welcome to Cinematic Excrement, where our charisma checks are always successful. As some of you may recall, a while back I reviewed the 2000 movie Dungeons & Dragons. It was quite horrible. It's one of those movies where pretty much everything went wrong. The story was stupid, the dialogue was cringe-inducing, the special effects were wretched, the makeup was just... weird. It ripped off Star Wars, it ripped off Indiana Jones, you had Jeremy Irons overacting, you had Thora Birch underacting, you had Tom Baker slumming it, you had Marlon Wayans doing whatever the fuck he was doing. Seriously, why was Marlon Wayans cast in a Dungeons & Dragons movie? Who thought this was a good idea? I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't hate the guy, he's fine in the right role, this was not the right role! I still do not understand who this was supposed to appeal to. Critics hated it, D&D fans hated it, everyone hated it, and it bombed spectacularly. And one would think that would have been the end of it. At least until the inevitable reboot, which is apparently in the works right now. But no, that was not the end. They actually made a sequel. It took them five years to do it, which is a bit odd. Then again, it took him almost 20 years to make a sequel to Tron, so I guess five years isn't that long, all things considered. I'm just amazed they made it at all. I mean, who was asking for this? Well, whether you like it or not, in 2005, we got Dungeons & Dragons Wrath of the Dragon God. At least the title sounds cool. Now, this movie was pretty heavily scaled back compared to its predecessor, which makes sense. I mean, who the hell would want to dump another $40 million into this franchise after... LET THE BLOOD RAIN FROM THE sky! Yeah, they were lucky to get a quarter of the first movie's budget after that hot mess. And instead of getting a theatrical release, this was made for the Sci-Fi Channel, back when they knew how to spell sci-fi. So, some lower production values are to be expected. For starters, this is what the Kingdom of Izmir looked like in the first movie. This is what it looks like in the second. Yeah, I totally believe this is the same place. It looks like they filmed this movie in an old Eastern European castle. Because they did. Well, if you can't afford to build sets for your movie, just borrow a Lithuanian tourist attraction and occasionally paste a couple of CGI towers in the background. I'm sure it'll work just fine. Wrath of the Dragon God takes place about a hundred years after the events of the first movie. So if you were hoping to find out what the hell happened to Ridley and friends, I'm afraid we'll never know. On the plus side, no more Marlon Wayans since his character would have died long ago. Possibly not for the first time. The only returning character is Damodar, played once again by Bruce Payne, and he's pretty much the best part of the movie, so I'm okay with this. And thank the gods he doesn't have to wear that blue lipstick again, though he still has a few oddities, namely his habit of eating through a hole in his back. I guess that's supposed to be where Ridley stabbed him in the last movie, so good on them for paying attention to continuity, but why does he have to eat through there? I mean, I'm no doctor, but something about that just doesn't seem right. Now, if you saw the first movie, first of all, I'm sorry. And second, you're probably wondering how Damodar could still be alive. Even if he somehow survived getting stabbed in the back and thrown off a 200-foot tower, unlikely, a century has passed. Surely he would have died of old age by now. Well, here's the man himself to explain. My master, Trophian, cursed me to return as a corpse creature should I fail him. Which I did not! Whoa! Someone's getting defensive. And pardon me for asking the obvious question, but did Profian's master plan involve this? <laughs> Because if it did not, I would say that constitutes a failure. He was killed before the damnation could be removed. Well, that's kinda your fault for getting your ass shanked by a punk-ass little thief and not being there to defend him, now isn't it? And now, thanks to you, we will never see Profian again. Hmm. Call me crazy, but in a way, I kinda miss his scenery chewing. It grew on me after a while. So after a century of wandering around as an undead monstrosity, Damodar finally found a mystical orb of something or other that restored him to his former glory. It also somehow gave him control over a slumbering black dragon that he plans to wake up and unleash on the people of Izmir. What chance does Ishmir have against me now? Wait, Ishmir? 
Okay, I take back what I said about them paying attention to continuity. It was not pronounced Ishmir in the first movie. It was Izmir. And you were in the first movie. You should know this. Damodar's plans are eventually discovered by the people of Izmir, or Ishmir, or whatever the fuck it's called now, when they inadvertently stumble upon the dragon's resting place. A young mage named Melora tries to use some sort of vision spell to find more information, but the spell quickly goes awry when she briefly gets a vision of Damodar. What happened? I don't know, you tell me. You screamed and the table exploded. I would show you the scene of the table exploding, but there's just one problem. It doesn't exist. They must have really slashed the budget for this movie if they couldn't even afford to break a table. Melora then casts a spell of greater exposition and informs the Council of Mages, led by some old dude named Oberon, that they must stop Damodar before he wakes up the dragon and makes a right mess of things. Unfortunately, even the combined power of the mages cannot divine Damodar's location, because reasons, so they're going to have to track him down the hard way. The captain of the guard, Valerius, is currently away on a mission, so the duty is passed on to Beric, the former captain of the guard who has since retired. Apparently, the retirement agent Ishmir is 30. Beric assembles a party of adventurers to aid him on his quest. Lux, a barbarian with a proficiency in bar fighting, Dorian, a cleric of Obad Hai who does not tolerate disrespect in his temple, Ormaline, an elf wizard with the power to remove superimposed backgrounds, Nim, a halfling rogue who does not like being cheated out of his fee, and Kyle, a Jew. Paladin! So we have a party of adventurers, each with their own unique skill sets, in search of a magical item currently held by a great evil. You know, this Dungeons and Dragons movie is starting to sound an awful lot like Dungeons and Dragons. Imagine that! Although I don't think Dungeons and Dragons was the writer's only influence. Look at some of the character names. Beric, Oberon, Dorian, Valerius. Someone's a George R.R. R. Martin fan. And so the party ventures forth on its quest to stop Damodar. But first they have to find out where the hell he is. So they must find the vault of an old wizard named Malik who has a pool of sight that can divine Damodar's location. The pool of sight is stronger than their own divination spells. Because reasons. Then the mage can teleport them there. Unfortunately, they have no idea where Malik's vault is. But Beric knows some goblins who do know the location of the vault. So their village is the first stop on their journey. So they have to go find a guy who knows the location of a magical place, and once they get to the magical place, they can divine the location of the big bad. Does anyone else think this is starting to sound like Krull? And is anyone else as concerned about that as I am? Meanwhile, Melora and the mages will prepare themselves to destroy Damodar's magical orb should the party return successfully. And they'd better return quickly as Melora's magical encounter with Damodar has somehow put a curse upon her, and she may not be long for this world. Ooh, you might want to put some ointment on that. As far as our new heroes go, I suppose they're a bit better than the losers we encountered in the last movie. At least none of them act like this. <laughs> Nim, played by Tim Stern, is definitely my favorite of the bunch. He's a devious little fucker who is mostly looking out for number one, and has no patience for those he considers beneath him. Which is most people, really. Never before have I heard such blubbering. <laughs> Some champions. But he's not entirely an asshole. He knows his role in this merry band of adventurers and is happy to use his skills when the situation calls for it. He even prevents Lux from stumbling into a trap. He saved my life. Speaking of Lux, I'm not really sure what to make of her. Barbarians aren't exactly known for their tact and have a tendency to go berserk now and then, and Ellie Chidsey definitely nails that aspect of the character. But this leads to some of the movie's sillier moments. Early on in their journey, Nim exposits Lux's brother once flipped out and killed a bunch of people and had to be put down. By Barrack, in fact. And he wonders if they need to worry about Lux doing the same. This is her response. Do you doubt my control? Is that a trick question? Oh, and if you thought the fact that Barrett killed Lux's brother might lead to some dissension in the ranks, this is basically how their conversation goes. I'm sorry I had to kill your brother. Eh, it's cool. And that's it! Any possible tension snuffed out just like that! What was even the point? As far as the other heroes, there's not much to say, really. Fighter, mage, cleric... 
also a mage. Although Melora has dabbled in divine magic, so I guess she's technically a mage cleric dual class. They aren't very strongly written characters, and the acting ranges from average to crap. I suppose Melora is a bit sympathetic, since her body is slowly rotting away and she's becoming a zombie. And I suppose that would suck. Oh, shut up. But it's hard to feel sympathy for someone who makes such questionable decisions, like trying to summon a magman. For those of you who don't speak nerd, a magman is a creature from D&D that resembles a goblin made out of lava. Melora wants to summon one since the mages are having trouble deciphering a book that could help them destroy Damodar's orb, and since the people who created the book were known for using elemental magic, Melora reasons a creature from the elemental plane could help them. And Melora wants to summon this creature, made entirely out of lava, right into the middle of their library, where they are surrounded by wood and paper. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> oh, that's right, everything! Fortunately, Oberon's staff is also a plus four squirt gun, so he's able to stop the fiery creature, but not before it nearly burns the place down. You know, for a mage, you're pretty stupid. Anyway, our party of adventurers continues on its journey, which is occasionally interrupted by some seemingly random encounters. First, they run into a lich in the middle of the woods, and when they come to the goblin village, which has a distinct lack of goblins... I guess that shouldn't surprise me. They couldn't afford to break a table. Obviously, they wouldn't have the budget for goblins. They are suddenly accosted by a frost dragon, which turns Dorian into an isocleric. Oh shit, the healer's down. Party wipe imminent. Then they have to decipher a puzzle lock and fight off a party of bandits. Then they have to fight through a room filled with dark mantles and navigate through another puzzle. You know, I mentioned earlier this movie feels a bit more like Dungeons and Dragons, but there's both good and bad that comes with that. While it may be a bit more faithful to the source material, it often feels less like a movie based on D&D and more like we're just watching a bunch of people play the game. Kind of like Unforgotten Realms or The Gamers, but without the humor. And when you take away the humor, there's not much left. And a game like this might be fun to play, but that doesn't mean it would make a good movie. But that's true of any D&D game that has ever been played. And I know some of you are going to say, well, actually, I once played a game that would make a good movie. No, no, you didn't. You might think you did, but you're wrong. I don't care how good you thought it was at the time. I don't care how much fun you had playing the game. It would not make a good movie. It would suck. Deal with it. Moving on. They eventually find Damodar's location, and the mage activates her teleportation spell. And ends up with her arm inside a wall. Or at least that's what it's supposed to look like. She's not doing a very good job of keeping her arm still inside that hole. But at least the arm is still attached to her body. That's more than I can say for Damodar. Looks like he's been... disarmed! I get it! Shut it, Nappa. Oddly enough, Damodar has almost no reaction to getting his arm chopped off. He doesn't look like he's in pain at all. He's just mildly surprised. Oh dear. You seem to have chopped off my arm. That's unfortunate. I suppose I'll fall down now. He has more of a reaction a few minutes later when his arm is regrown than he had when it was chopped off. Maybe he was too offended by the piss-poor editing to be bothered to react. I would not blame him. The editing during the fight scenes is, unfortunately, pretty atrocious throughout the movie. No matter what you may think, Mr. Director, your editing is not hiding the fact that your actors don't know how to sword fight. It's only making it obvious that you're trying to hide the fact that your actors don't know how to sword fight. Oh, what the fuck was that? So they bring the orb back to the city, formerly known as Izmir, so the mages can get to work undoing its magic. But remember the lich that Beric ran into on the way to Damodar's lair? He's apparently working for Damodar now. Because reasons. And he steals the orb. Well, that makes their quest to get the orb entirely pointless, doesn't it? That was a waste of an hour and a half. So Damodar wakes the dragon and... By the twin blades of Dristo Erden, what is this? That looks awful. And yet, it is not significantly worse than the CGI dragons in the first movie. I don't know how that's even possible, but there it is. The dragon destroys the orb, because fuck it, and proceeds to run amok on Ishmir. And then the lich just pisses off. Yeah, it's all like, well, I helped unleash the dragon, my work is done here, I'm out. Wow, what an amazingly compelling character that totally wasn't a huge waste of space. 
Anyway, Melora manages to defeat the dragon with her magic, and Damodar gets taken out by Lux rather easily since without the orb, he's completely useless. Way to make a potentially cool villain look like a chump, movie. But Beric stops Lux before she can finish him off. If you kill him, Melora dies. And just how do you propose to make him lift the curse? Ask him nicely? Pretty please with sugar on top, Mr. Damodar, sir, will you stop turning my wife into a zombie? Actually, he just threatens to kill him. And somehow that works. Bullshit. Why would that work? He's been killed before, he got better. Thanks to Prothean's curse, he's basically immortal, right? Well, the day is saved and the land of Ishmir is at peace. And somehow the elf mage's arm is restored. Huh. I guess it really was just a flesh wound. Well, that's Dungeons and Dragons, Wrath of the Dragon God. And it's a complete mess. The story is pretty weak, the acting is hit and miss, the special effects are just miss, the sets are bland, and the editing is awful. It did have a few bright spots, namely Tim Stern and Bruce Payne, but otherwise it's just a mediocre made-for-TV movie. But how does it compare to the first movie? Is it better or worse? Well... That's a tough one. While the first movie fell flat on its face, it did at least have ambition. They put some actual effort into the locations and set design, and it feels like a fantasy setting. I can't really say the same for Wrath of the Dragon God. Whether through budgetary constraints or just general laziness, it often looks pretty boring. Hell, there were times when it felt like I was watching a LARP rather than a fantasy movie. Sure, there are plenty of references to things you would find in a D&D setting, but they rarely amount to more than name drops. I don't just want to hear about these things, I want to see them. It's a movie. Show, don't tell. But while the first movie is basically Dungeons and Dragons in name only, Wrath of the Dragon God was far more faithful to the game it's based on. Perhaps a little too faithful. There are so many references to creatures, places, and items in the D&D canon, but so few of them are adequately explained. So anyone watching this movie who isn't already familiar with the game is going to be horribly confused. Hell, I have played D&D before and I still had to look a few things up. Nevertheless, I do give the filmmakers credit for at least trying to make an actual D&D movie. Plus, they didn't have the annoying presence of Marlon Wayans, so that's another point in their favor. I don't know. It's better in some ways and worse in others, so I guess it comes down to how each movie made me feel. With the first movie, I was infuriated. With the second, I was just bored. So, I guess boredom wins? But I certainly wouldn't recommend Wrath of the Dragon God unless you're a hardcore D&D fan. And even then, there's not much to like. Next time, we are going to dive into the bizarre little mind of one Kirk Cameron. Against my better judgment. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and it looks like Hollywood has once again failed its saving throw versus Suck. control.